Hey guys, I'm Ian, of course, and I am out here in West Texas, outside of about an hour outside of Abilene, to do some hunting. I had a chance to do uh, to go on a hunting trip oh about two years ago, actually by invitation in Scotland, and it was fantastic. It happened that I was going to be there at the right time, and everything worked out. And that was my first real experience with hunting, and I found that I rather enjoyed it, and I wanted to try some more of it in a little more convenient location. And so what I found was up here outside of Abilene at the T-Diamond Ranch, they run a field to table uh, hunting experience. It's a couple day trip. We're gonna spend two or three days actually out hunting uh, for deer and hog and boar. And then we're also going to get instruction on cleaning, preparing and cooking. So the thing that I found is most people who are into hunting have like their dad was a hunter their uncle was a hunter they have friends who are hunters who are able to basically show them the ropes and i don't actually have that no one in my family has ever really been into hunting and so it's kind of a giant bundle of unknowns for me and this seemed like a really interesting way to have a good guided experience and kind of learn the ropes a bit to get me set up so that if i decide i want to do more of it i can do it more on my own so anyway uh, we are going to continue into the actual ranch house and uh, go through some orientation, zero out the rifles, and I think the first hunt starts this evening. All right, so step one is check my zero. Of course, I already zeroed my rifle before I came out here. I have it set up for a 100 yard dead on zero. We're going to be shooting, I believe, at between 75 and 125 yards. Uh, you can see some of this scrub thicket. This is close range stuff. However, I want to make sure that that zero hasn't shifted as the rifle's been bouncing around in transit because I want to know that wherever I put that crosshair is exactly where that bullet is going to hit. A uh, critical uh, component of making a clean and ethical kill. So let's get that done. All right, zero was dead on, so now it's off to find an animal. Just a quick note on some gear. This, to me, uh, the gear here is not particularly important to this experience. Uh, the rifle, frankly, is, it's an important part, but the hunting is not the main element of what we're doing here. The main element is going to be processing, cleaning, butchering, and cooking. However, you can't do that until you actually have an animal to work with. And the rifle is the tool we're going to be using here to get that animal, or several animals actually. So I have a Steyr Scout, it's in 6.5 Creedmoor. I have a, actually a pretty old, simple, uh, two to seven power Leupold VX2 scope. It's got just a plain crosshair, no mill dots or anything like that. I have a Dead Air Nomad suppressor on it, which I think is, frankly, I have no interest in hunting without a suppressor uh, because that suppressor means that I don't have to wear ear protection while I'm out on the range. Uh, it means I can appreciate and enjoy nature that I'm hanging out in while hunting. Uh, less likely to scare off all the game uh, should I have an opportunity for more than one shot. Anyway, I think it's an excellent addition to any rig like this. And anyway, uh, the Steyr Scout itself, it, it's light. Uh, it's made a little heavier by that can, but uh, light and handy to carry around. It's got an integrated bipod that I really like, um, and it's got a five round detachable box magazine with a spare magazine located in the buttstock. So I can take the rifle out and I've got 10 rounds on me, which is more than enough. The ammo, by the way, is S&B, sell your and below, uh, 140 grain soft point 6.5 Creedmoor, which should be plenty suitable for the animals that uh, I am out looking for on this trip, which are uh, hog and Texas deer. So normally my preference would be to stalk to actually get out and walk and, and track down an animal. I think there's more sport involved in that. Here we're shooting from a stand and we're doing that because, well, in this brush country, it's very difficult to actually track something down. You have to get really close and it's really hard. And the point of this is not so much the hunt, it's the prep and the cook. So we're up in a stand here. Um, I have thus far, did two pigs. 
pigs and one very small doe deer, and I have one more pig to get. So it's just waiting and watching. So it's not quite dark yet, but we probably only have about 10 minutes of light left. So far we've actually seen two bucks, but we're not mounting buck, and one coyote, but I'm not interested in shooting a coyote. We've seen no pigs at all, so I don't think any are gonna show up in the next 10 minutes. We'll keep watching, but I think this will have to go till tomorrow morning's hunt, and hopefully I'll get one then. She just went down and is not moving. All right, so I got a little bit excited because we're in the very last minutes of light today. And uh, this guy showed up and what I should have done was be a little more patient and make sure that this was a sow because what they told us coming out here was like, you want to avoid single pigs that come out by themselves because they'll probably be stringy boars that aren't such great eating. And you want to wait for a group of them and pick out a sow. And that all kind of went poof right out of my head when at the last moment I'm like, there's one! And I got a fantastic shot because he just went down. We've got a big old puddle of blood here. Um, however, he's got some tusks on him and this is very clearly a male pig. However, uh, we're going to go ahead and process him up anyway. And specifically, we're going to try an experiment. I want to try an experiment. I haven't talked to the chef about this yet, but... I want to try making haggis, the, of course, classic Scottish, uh, I don't know if I'd say delicacy, but dish, which consists primarily of the liver, heart, and lungs of a sheep. Well, pork's close enough. We'll try it with a pig. We'll call it Southwestern haggis. And the issue is, in the U.S., the FDA does not consider lungs to be edible. So you can't buy them, you can't sell them as food. Well, this ugly dude still has both of his lungs, and so instead of dumping them with the rest of the internals when we field clean him, we're going to keep the lungs, the heart, and the liver, and see what we can do, see what southwestern pork haggis tastes like. <laughs> structures are the same, the muscles are the same, and the concept of taking them apart are basically the same. There's some no-nos that we don't want to do with deer that we would do with beef, but, uh, but basically overall the concept is exactly the same. So well, I'm going to be talking about concepts the entire time. So the number one factor that affects taste and tenderness is the age of the animal. 
So everybody's out there after a big rack, you know, this big mature buck or bull, and they're four or five years old. Well, that meat chews as good as the antlers chew. I mean, they're they're tough. They hold, that that would be an old stewing hen that we throw in the pot and cook the heck out of it to make it tender and tasty. Okay, so here, this is the New York strip. So this would be right here, the loin where there's no ribs. That's the strip loin. That's the New York steak. On the inside is the tenderloin. Some people call them the fish. These are the tenderloins. So if you cut a steak off of this side, you got a T-bone. You got the New York strip on one side, the filet mignon on the other. So that's a T-bone or a porterhouse steak. So from a chef's perspective, all tender cuts get dry cooking methods. All tender cuts of any animal gets dry cooking methods. So that's stir fried, saute, pan fried, deep fried, broiled, grilled, and roast. High heat, fast, and always served rare, with the exception of pig and bear and poultry. So those are basically the concepts of braising. Stewing is the same thing, only it's done on the stove top, and we cut portion sizes smaller. So we have a brown stew, like a ragu. We have a white stew, which would be a blanquette. So you can order a veal blanquette, or chicken blanquette, or rabbit blanquette, any white meat you could use to make a white stew. Get those concepts? That, that's really, really important to understand those concepts. So here, you can you know, put your fingers right here. So, there is a piggy tenderloin, and that's the head, and that's the tail, I think. <laughs> and I'm just going to do it the opposite, so I'm just going to pull this out this way. And uh, this is why we would do this before we aged it. Yeah. You see that right there? That's why we would cut this before we aged it. Because all of that right there and all this would permeate the good meat and we would and we would ruin it because of that blood would sour. So I would do this first. And there's the loin right there. So I don't want to cut into you that prime rib right there. And also, again, when I was talking about peeling all that meat off, I'd go right down the back and peel the neck with it as well. Mm. So there's all, there's all different ways of doing this, but you can see how shot up that is. So, you know, we could still get some meat off of here, but the inside of that is 
pretty bad. And then come across. Yeah. Uh, and don't be afraid. Do I, don't be afraid. Do I, do I get it close to, like, close to here or close to here? Right down the middle. Down the middle. Yep. Right down the middle. And don't be afraid to, you know, you're not going to lose any Oh, wow. It kind of just comes out like butter. Okay, I didn't know what that was, but that he said good. Yep. That's some big chunky uh, That's a big chicken wing. Yeah. Okay, as soon as you get those off, we're going to start on. I'm good at all. Got a big old thick neck. Been working out. I, I shot Jim Wall. Right. Right. It's fine. You get on the other side of the spine. Yeah, you'll get. You got the feel for it. That's that's the most important thing. Is that you can see how we cut a piece of that off. Right? Yeah, right here. That's right here. Come on, come on. 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 Come on, so this is like the knee joint, so it bends right there. This is the inside. So I'm just going to come around right here. Matter of fact, I've got to come down a little further. Follow this joint right here. When you get down there, if you do it like this, it'll, you know, it'll bend down. This, so we just, <laughs> so we just come follow this, and we're not cutting to the cutting board, we're cutting to the bone, literally. So there's the marrow bones, this is the shank, heart shaped, top round, inside round, most tender cut, sirloin butt, knuckle, and underneath here is the bottom and eye of the round. So I'm gonna take this apart so remember when we said we don't cut round steaks? Because if we cut a round steak out of this, look at look what's on the inside yeah. of that leg. That's why it tastes gamey yeah. on that muscle on that stick. All this is in there. Okay, uh, so we got the we got the okay. top inside, we got the bottom, we got the knuckle, we got the eye, we got the sirloin butt, the shank, and the heel, and the wow. bone. Okay, so that's what each of you can work on the next the home that I feel bone in there. Once you get all the way around, but the second bone goes up from here to here. This way. You want to come down. You're you're there, but you want to come down, and then you see this. See how far down you have to come to this joint. So we have to go all the way around this joint. All the way around that baby. And then back up. Looking good. So here we go again. Shank. Yep. Shank. Heel. Top round. Top round or inside. Middle round. Bottom. Bottom round. Eye of the round. Eye of the round. Football, yeah. That's the butt up by the tail. Piece of cake, piece of cake. So this part here. On these cuts, do you want these packaged uh, double packed or do you want them uh, singles? I'm thinking singles. Okay. Because I don't expect we'd ever be cooking two of them at the same time. 
just pull out of the freezer and you're ready to go. Yeah. So one of the things that, and I'm sure Chef went over it with you. So each one, each one takes uh, about 30 seconds per package. Okay. But instead of sucking all the air out, it that whole thing really just creates a vacuum inside. And just what's going to happen, it builds up and it releases, and everything just sucks down and, it, it, uh, and that heat bar will seal it. So it's a, it's a pretty little cool process. Now we've got a piece all ready for the freezer. We'll mark venison because we will also have some pork. Oh, good idea. So we're going to demonstrate one cooking method. So if I was doing this at a hotel teaching a bunch of apprentice cooks uh, how to saute, this would, this would be the same kind of demo. Or if we were in a culinary school or sometimes at sports shows, etc. So the concept here is that we saute veal, we saute venison, we saute shrimp, and scallops. So this one, this dish is going to be au poire, which is just basically the pepper. We want to keep it fairly dry. Some chefs season it with different spices. I don't like to always put salt on it. Uh, you know, because it draws out the moisture and then it prevents some browning or condensation. Because if you overload the pan, the meat cools it and then you're not searing the meat, then you're wetting the meat, which means you're cooking it in some juice. So when you're going to just give it a shake and it comes right away. Even if this was an aluminum pan or a stainless steel pan, it comes right away. So you can see already how it's cooking around the edges, that brown. That brown, that caramelization is what we want on the meat, the flavor. Because if you put it in there and you, uh, and you overloaded the pan, all the juice would come out of the meat. Like when we make stew and then you see a bunch of water in there, that we just made a big mistake. Because now you're poaching the meat or sweating it in some juice. You give it some action. That right there, that's called FOM, F-O-M-D. That brown stuff is what gives you the color and the flavor in your sauce. Okay, so now what we have is we have some green peppercorns. So I'm going to put this back on the heat. And we're basically just going to deglaze this FOM by adding stuff. So we're going to add some mustard. We're going to add green peppercorns. So these are in vinegar. So this is a real strong, pungent dish, which I wouldn't do with veal, I would do with beef or venison. Peppercorns sometimes tend to pop. We're going to add some pepper to this. We want it peppery. And we're just going to give it a shake, but we're going to use some brandy and show. Uh, a little bit of sherry to the brandy. And you know, if you want to just stay in back, because I don't want to burn the hair off your eyelashes. So basically, and we never pour it straight out of the bottle. So basically, we just pour it over here. And this is going to be glazed. It's going to flame and flambe off the paper. And we burn off the alcohol out of the brain. So that liquid right there, you just going to take that bond off the bottom of the pan. Uh, it burns it off. So why don't we need the meat in the pan? Because we don't want to overcook it. Because if we overcook any tender cut, we're going to make it dry and chew. So if this is boiling down, that meat's boiling in there, and it's going to overcook. And it's going to make it dry and chew. We got some green onion. I didn't have any of the herbs, so I just thought we'll use that. So I'm just going to take this meat. Now put it back in. Remember, we want this smothered in salt. So if you could hand me that tray over there, please. But then I just do this because because I don't know. Yeah, because I know I'm gonna be messing. Real good. I'll eat all that. So 
we are taking our venison backstrap or loin and we are cutting uh, butterfly medallions out of that. This dish has some sort of fancy Italian name that I don't know. It is saltimbo. Uh, we are going to take these, pound them flat, and then stuff them with fontina cheese, thin sliced prosciutto, and basil. And it will end up looking something like this. And then they go on the grill and they get sauteed and then uh, doused in a nice mushroom marsala sauce. So we're going to now go ahead and take the pans that we cooked all of our venison in, we've added a little bit of masala wine, and we're going to deglaze the pans and then pour that liquid uh, over our uh, resting venison. We have a semolina mix here with a bunch of cheese and butter that makes it fantastic. Topped with uh, some fresh carrots and green beans. And then the star of the show is venison and salting buca, which are butterfly medallions that are stuffed with fontina cheese, uh, prosciutto, and fresh beans. Topped with a marsala mushroom. And it's just fantastic. Sounds and crumbled prosciutto. Oh All right, so I am at the end of my extended weekend here, and it has been, frankly, fantastic. It doesn't hurt that we end with a wee dram of scotch. But uh, it was everything from practice and zeroing at the shooting range. They have a thousand yard range here for you to really hone your skills on. And then hunting, uh, taking a couple of animals, feel, learning how to field dress the animals, learning how to do the final butchering, how to take your uh, skinned, gutted carcass, turn it into primal cuts, turn those into actual packageable, usable, cookable cuts of meat, and then actually cooking them. So we kind of, the, the last day kind of turned into, now you're going to be commercial kitchen cooks. And we did a four-course meal of uh, a variety of preparations of our venison and our wild boar. Got a chance to do our wild boar haggis as kind of a separate custom experiment that turned out really well. Uh, it really, overall, it was a fantastic experience. So um, a really big thanks to Outdoor Solutions. Their website for this is fromfieldtotable.com. They didn't sponsor this, they didn't talk to me about it, I thought this would be a really fun thing to do, and I paid for this entirely out of my own funds, which is to say entirely out of your Patreon funds. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this, it's really opened up a whole new area to me, and it's that step that lets you go from, I'd really like to control my own food sources, I like to know how to have game meat, how do I get it, how do I work with it, how do I deal with it. Uh, if you don't have that brother or uncle or father who is into hunting, I think there's, it's really hard to get a foot in the door and figure out how to do it, and this is a fantastic way uh, to do that. So if you're interested, check out their website. It's a fantastic bunch of people here, and I had a great weekend. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little sort of teaser overview video, because um, I certainly did. So.